Okay. Welcome, everybody. It is Monday, October 17th at 1 o'clock Eastern Time, and this is Admissions Live. I'm your host, Daniela Norton. On today's live broadcast, we're talking about numbers, 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 more numbers, as many numbers as you can think of. Um, what's the best way to interpret your enrollment metrics? Uh, how to take charge of your enrollment funnel by understanding the data it's offering? Um, basic metrics to monitor, identifying the importance of variable metrics in each level of your funnel, and discussing the smart reporting tactics to help make interpreting those metrics easier. Admissions Live is part of the Higher Ed Live Network, offering viewers direct access to the best and brightest minds in education. Live broadcasts allow viewers to share knowledge and participate in discussions around the most important issues in the industry. Today's live, view today's live viewing experience is powered by Maestro, the premier marketing tech platform for broadcasters. All episodes of Admissions Live are free and accessible in the video archives at higheredlive.com and in podcast format, format on iTunes. Today's episode is made possible by Chegg. Um, so thank you, as usual, to Chegg for sponsoring Admissions Live. We've got a nice tweet going out to you all. Um, and it's also, Higher Ed Live is also produced by M. Stoner, a marketing and communications firm that works with educational institutions on branding, strategy, web design, and more. So now that all that housekeeping has been taken care of, I would like to welcome today's guest, John Anspa. Uh, yeah, everybody's going to say John's waving. <laughs> John is an analytics expert who's transformed the enrollment funnel and data modeling at Oral Roberts University in Tulsa, Oklahoma by streamlining reporting, identifying hidden KPIs, and increasing the efficiency of recruiting decisions and processes to generate a 900% growth. That's not a typo, guys. That is a 900% growth in the prospect funnel since January 2016, so January of this year. So welcome, John. Hello, everybody. We've got about eight viewers tuned in already. So hello, everybody. I just want to give a quick shout out to all of our colleagues who are at Higher Ed Live this week. We hope you're having fun and learning a lot. And be sure to check back um, on Higher Ed Live for a recap of all the fun stuff that's going on at High Ed Web this week. So let's go ahead and uh, get started. For those of you who are viewing and who aren't at High Ed Web in Memphis, don't hesitate to ask questions using the hashtag Higher Ed Live. Um, I'll do my best to answer questions as they come in and field them to John. So the first question on the docket today, John, is uh, what metrics, in your opinion, and universally, are the most important, and what metrics should folks be looking at? Uh, well, before I answer that, I just wanted to clarify that 900% growth has been in our online learning enrollment funnel. Oh, we've, fair enough. We've been do, doing a sizable amount of marketing and uh, approach to re-strategize and optimize the online aspect of our of our funnel. Uh, but coming back to the question that just about the important metrics, this one is kind of a very hard thing to answer on a general scope because it's very personalized. One thing that we found and that's been extremely successful at ORU is the fact that we're looking not so much at the standard KPIs of click-through rates, conversion rates, and what and so forth, but we're looking more at what is creating those optimizations, what channels are creating higher, uh, higher conversion rates, which channels are higher engagements, where the students are, are they interacting or are they on more of a read-only basis? So there's a lot of decisions that go into the KPIs and the metrics, but one of the first, uh, first and foremost things that, that we did at ORU was we took stock of what channels were working for this specific funnel. We found that uh, over the three funnel, the three main funnels we have of undergrad, graduate, and online, that they have very different approaches for each one based on the channel of how we're reaching the student. So beyond the normal metrics that you're looking at, you need to look at the channel itself to make sure that it's still a viable source. So what channels are you guys looking at? Social media channels, your website channels? A little bit of both, honestly. Uh, one of the biggest ones that we've been analyzing heavily are the social channels. It depends on the demographic that you're looking at. You may be looking at millennials using more of Snapchat and Instagram on, a ba on an annual basis versus a, the older generation that may be looking more at Facebook to keep in touch with their family. There's a lot of different perspective points that we're looking at to identify the proper channel per persona. Have you, is there anything 
I think a lot of people rely on social and think that it's almost a silver bullet. Is there any tips you can give folks out there that, you know, may, where to best put your efforts? Uh, constantly iterate. One thing that we're finding substantially just across the board with ourselves as well as some of the research groups that we've been a part of is the fact that they've actually coined a new term for social advertising that's ad fatigue of just the longer you see an ad, the more attuned you are to ignore it. You may see the same ad four or five times pop up in your feed. So the big piece about it are these iterations, are the pieces that change what ads are being displayed so that you can constantly be, uh, be displaying fresh content and it attracts the eye to, hey, that's something new. That is a great tip. So um, how have these metrics changed over the years? Uh, very substantially. Uh, as the technology itself has changed, so have all the metrics. I mean, historically speaking, your click-throughs, your conversion rates, your engagement rates, the interaction rates themselves are still important. But one of the biggest pieces, and this is where we kind of get into that hidden KPI mentality, is we've taken a step back and looked at, okay, this may have a 10% conversion, but what are the different stages of conversion? Is this one person converting five times? Is this five people converting 20 times? And one of the pieces that we've really started to take stock of and that's helped lead to that substantial growth is the fact that we're looking more at each persona and the different levels. So you may have one touch engagement, so you may have a five touch engagement and figuring out how to optimize that engagement point for each one of those sub personas. Does that make sense? That does make sense. Um, well, to me, maybe talk about what a subpersona is for those who are tuning in. So a subpersona is a subset of the same grouping. So you may have a persona of a middle-aged mom that's a single mom that's working and that's wanting to pursue an arts degree, that she had the passion for or for art or music in her younger years. Well, the piece with that is you may have a single mother who's 20 who fits that model, or you may have a single mother with five kids who's working two part-time jobs that had, that would love to do it, but simply doesn't have the time. And the, uh, the difference between those is the 20-year-old may spend more time on social, whereas you may only be able to catch the other through an email base. Mm -hmm. So even within the persona itself, you have to sub-segment and make sure that you're optimizing each one of the strategies to reach the groupings that are working within that persona. That makes sense. I also feel like, you know, we used to measure things like the first source of contact, but a lot of the literature and a lot of stuff that's out there now is saying that a better metric is um, maybe a conversion rate from that source as opposed to it being the first or the first touch. Uh, is that true? It's definitely true. One piece, though, that we've taken a step back and reassessed that whole scenario is we're compiling those into one piece. So we're looking at each first source to then determine the uh, the down segment of it or the funnel of, okay, from that first touch, did it take three emails, two social media ads, and a phone call to get them to convert? Or was it a first touch conversion by itself? So within each one of those, we're taking those touch points of this is a four touch, a five touch, a six touch, and figuring out how to best strategize the comm flows around that to lead to more optimization through the new marketing tools that are out there. Nice. How common is a four, five, or six touch constituent? We've found it's fairly high, especially within the online learning area, because you have a lot of schools offering online. So you may have somebody say they're interested in an IT program here, but then they see, oh, they have a, a full arts program available there or an MBA program over here. So you may end up with multiple interest points, but the challenge that we find is compiling those back into one person to say, okay, at this ad, they converted saying they wanted this. At, after two more emails on this, they changed and said they're interested in art. Mm -hmm. And so being able to track what led to those additional conversions aids in maintaining the best sources to know what the actual information they need is. Fascinating. All right, so talk to us about your variable metrics. What are they? Why are they important? The variable metrics I was talking about go back into that multi-segmented persona. Uh, we're finding that as we look at this, like I said, you may have somebody that converts best off of three ads to emails, but then you may have the exact opposite with three emails to ads. 
So what we're doing, uh, we've actually implemented a CRM and we're starting to maintain some of our tracking systems directly into that at each point of conversion so that we can track down what led to conversion number two to conversion number three and then be able to determine from there it may be a two, a two lead step conversion to saying I'm interested in two separate programs, but then they convert to an application. So the variable metrics are more of a, uh, are more of a probability metric that look at, okay, for an application of this degree, what was the best segmentation that we found that led to the highest conversion? I see. And, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, and it varies depending on the segment or on the program that you're looking at. You may have an IT program that's a very hot commodity in the world that converts after two emails on the social ad. Well, then you may have something more of like a liberal arts program that takes 10 touch points in order to reach it. So what we found is as we're building these campaigns around each one of the programs that we can specify the campaign variables and the different touch points that go out to meet that 10 touch point that works for this one, but then condensing it to a two touch for the other ones. Wow. I feel like 10 touch points is a lot. I feel like the variable data, the sub personas, can you talk about your staff and the organization maybe? Are you the only person uh, working on this? Yes and no. This is still kind of in its infancy for us, but we've seen substantial growth in it, so we know it's going to be a longer term strategy. Uh, to be completely honest, it's been kind of an experiment that we've been running to try to drive some more engagement points. We were given a goal over the summer to reach a certain number of leads for our online learning department, our online learning recruiters, and we met that goal and exceeded it when our administration didn't think we were going to be able to meet the goal in general. And so we've started adopting that philosophy into other areas with trying to create these more multi multifaceted campaigns that reach each subgrouping or segment as they go through. Now, we do have a full team of recruiters, but our marketing team is a very small team. We just expanded to, uh, to right now, there's three people on our digital team and that one person just started in the last week. So we've been doing this with a very small team, and that's the benefit of the automation platforms. You can set it, run it for a couple weeks, and then analyze the data, and then iterate off of it. You don't have to have a substantial marketing team in order to accomplish these. It's just finding, figuring out how and finding a way of dedicating five, six hours a week to build it out and then to maintain it with iterations. Very cool. We'll get to that reporting in a second. Um, I'm sort of interested in, have you seen any trends develop over the course or what are the major sort of, you mentioned 10 touch points for like a liberal arts degree as opposed to, you know, smaller touch points for another. Can you talk about some of the trends that you guys have discovered so far? <sighs> to be honest, it's been a little bit low. It's been a little bit short to be able to establish a long-term trend. Uh, one of the pieces that we have seen is anything within the computer related industries has a much faster conversion rate and a much higher interest rate for an online program than some of the other fields that we offer. We've seen a fairly, a fairly large growth in the business administration side with a couple of the degree paths that we offer, but we just launched a new IT program and it's just taken off like wildfire because it's such a hot demand field in the world. So content is still king for those of you who are listening out there. Very much so. <laughs> I love it. Um, so you mentioned KPIs, uh, key performance uh, indicators. What are the ones you're paying attention to and why? There's quite a few. Uh, with ORU, we actually have a, a, well, we are trying to continue growing our international audience. So we have several varied KPIs for our domestic audience as well as our international. One of the big ones that we're looking at is we actually just relaunched our website in May, which was a massive undertaking in and of itself. And we've seen a double digit growth across the board because we took, you know, we took the time and paid attention to what the students wanted, not necessarily what we had to offer. And one of the biggest pieces that we monitor with it is our usage rates. We look at time on site, we look at content interaction, we look at their user, uh, the user flow or the behavioral flow throughout the website and throughout our content so that we can better strategize, okay, they're looking for info on a degree versus they're looking for information on financial aid and then craft those touch points that we can send to them to help guide them deeper into the site by default. 
So I feel like a lot of times we've got board members or trustees who who know maybe a little bit about web and analytics and sometimes what they're asking you to pay attention to is different than what you feel like um, you should be paying attention to and what is actually important. Is that something you can, have you, have you guys ever come across that and how do you sort of shift that Mm, that conversation to get people better aligned with what they should be paying attention to. Part of it is smoke screen. <laughs> just being completely honest. A large part of what we end up doing is we look at the data that, that shows the growth that we're experiencing and they may want to know the number of users, whereas the number of page views actually shows a realistic perspective of the growth of the site. Even if you're down 3% in users, but up 22% in page views, that just goes to show you that you have more users spending more time on your site. Whereas, yes, you have a, a marketing issue to get people there or an entry point issue to solve, but the piece that they want to see is that the site is growing and the users are using the site. So while we, while we may show them, okay, we're down 3%, but we've seen a 20% growth in the usage of the site, they're not going to care about that down percentage anymore because they see the growth in the other step. So it's a little bit of smoke screen and mirrors and kind of getting them to the data that you want. Now, of course, if the board calls us and says, we want this stat, we're going to report that stat. But if it's down in a number, we're going to provide extra statistics to show why it's down or how we're working to actively solve it. Use the numbers to your advantage. Yes. Um, earlier, I think you and I were talking sort of before the broadcast, but even in the write-up, you use the term hidden KPIs. Mm -hmm. um, what do you mean? And can you give us some examples of what hidden KPIs are? Hidden KPIs are kind of like I was just talking about, those pieces that actually show the value that the board or the administration may be looking for. You may have a board member that wants to see the bounce rate on your website to make sure that it's going up. Well, that's a very vital piece. A hidden KPI may be the percentage of new visits or new users to your website because you may have a faculty intranet that's creating a five minute per page view that's actually not a realistic perspective. So the hidden KPIs are more for the functional work and the optimization tactics of the website or of any marketing channel that you're using that you're able to see the actual results being used well being able to balance what the board or the final report needs to show. Does that make sense? That does make sense. And we were talking earlier about um, how important it is to know where this data comes from for these yes. hidden KPIs, right? Yes. Now, again, the hidden KPI is going to vary depending on what the channel is, what your purpose is. You're going to have a different KPI for an email campaign versus trying to drive traffic through your website. That is going to vary drastically among the piece. Now, you can get almost all of this data out of Google Analytics if you know how to use it or through the other reporting tools. Facebook, for instance, with their social platform, they give you a lot deeper look into your click-through rates that a lot of people don't realize you can look at the overall ad click-through as well as looking at each element of the ad to see did they click on the headline, did they click the image, did they click the button, did they click the link, and those are very important pieces to determine how you can craft your message. For instance, if you have a really long URL that you're putting in there, they may click on it, but you may save time later and have a return user if you put something of a vanity sort that's a lot easier for them to remember. A lot of it is just using the data that's at your fingertips while identifying where that data is coming from. So that's the challenge that a lot of people face is they have a lot of data, but they don't know how to process it. That is the truth, and it's a perfect segue into our next question about reporting. So I, even in the first, you know, 15 minutes we've been talking here, there's data coming at you from all directions. Yes. You're looking at social, you're looking at web, you're looking at the enrollment, the international students. Um, how do you keep it all straight? <laughs> that is a juggling act, to be completely honest. Um, <laughs> Like I said, we're actually, we just launched our CRM and we're still in aspects of launching other components to it. One of the big pieces around that is the reporting system. Since we have a fresh system, we're taking all of our reporting back to the basics of what do we need, how can we accomplish it, and what systems are out there that interact with the system that we're using. So for instance, we're working with Salesforce for our new CRM. 
there are thousands of reporting systems and capabilities within Salesforce, but then again, you've got the Wave Analytics tool that Salesforce offers as a side package that can compile pretty much everything you need into one system. So a lot of the reporting, the best case I can tell you is just take a step back from it, figure out what you want, and then find a system that can do it for you. I mean, there's simple systems like we did on the other session a couple months back. There's a system called Cyf. It's C-Y-F-E. It's a very cheap package that you can drop any data source into and style it out. And that'll help get you going on your piece to then be able to solve what, uh, what's a better enterprise level solution for long-term reporting strategy. And correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding is once you have the process set up, that may be the heavy lifting and the bulk of it, but it pays off in the end to yes. be able, yep, and then you can refer back to it and, and adjust it accordingly. Yeah. The biggest challenge that a lot of people that I've talked to even on a freelance basis get into, they have this grand idea, but they can't visualize it sit down with a dry erase board and figure out, okay, we have our click-through rate and we have our website clicks. How do we want these reported? Do you want it in a bar chart? Do you want it in line charts? You've gotta, uh, you have to take the time to visualize the report so that you can then spend less time in the future working on reporting because it's there at your fingertips how you need it. Now, and Investing, oh, I was just going to say investing the time, like you said, is a challenge, but that will save you thousands of man hours over or throughout the future. If you can build the report once and click a button to generate it, that's all you're going to need when the next time the report comes up. So how often are you, are you getting these reports? Uh, on an hourly basis. Oh my gosh, wow. Yeah. Okay, and now how often do you report out? Because I think our board members would be very upset if we sent them reports on an hourly basis. <laughs> well, that's we use the hourly reporting to be able to, uh, to make optimization tactics in real-time data. Uh, one of the challenges that we find is a lot of the systems out there will give you a 24-hour review. Well, that's fine and dandy up to a point, but then you're still on a 24-hour cycle to be able to see what happened today that we need to solve for tomorrow. Well, now if you can't see today's data until tomorrow morning, it's too late to avoid the issue again and you've wasted another day of the issue. Does that make sense? That absolutely makes sense. Can you give us an example of something you, ha you adjusted based on an hourly uh, report? Uh, so, for instance, one of our vendors, we noticed that... Uh, so. Okay, I've got to figure out the easiest way to explain this. One of our vendors is generating their full optimization tactics on their own and feeding the data directly into our CRM. Well, what we noticed, because we had that hourly window, we went from, say, 30 to 40 an hour to zero. Well, we noticed something flatlined, and one of their we called them to try to figure it out, and we had, we had a three-hour window that it occurred in. We called them and they realized one of their techs had made a change and reverted back to a previous form that didn't feed into our system. So they still had all the data that we could grab and reconcile that window, but we were able to stop it ahead of time so our recruiters could continue working with the freshest data and contacting those students on the spur of the minute. Nice. Um, that wasn't a pre-planned question, so thanks, John, no. for being able to come up with that. <laughs> yeah, no, and one of the biggest things, like you were saying, is the board may not want the hourly reporting, but the benefit of having it is if you get a call at 2 in the morning, granted, I hate those calls when they happen, but they've happened, I can sit there and say, okay, I'll send it to you in a, t in a minute, and I'll text it to the board member, and they can have the report whenever they want. Because the way those systems are designed, it's, it generates the report whenever you access it. So if they want it on a quarterly basis, awesome, you can export the report and send it to them. If they want it at the spur of the moment, you have it ready to go. And that's where the benefit of that comes in. If they call, you don't have to say, okay, give me a couple hours and I'll get the report to you. You can have it to them within a couple minutes and it makes you look good while giving them the, uh, the view that you know what you're doing and a little bit more expertise in their mind to trust you with the data. We always want to look good for the board members. Yes. <laughs> um, is there anything that you maybe leave out of the reports or that you don't include on purpose? <sighs> Of course, we try to leave out any down numbers. That's just, the, that's just the fact of life. One thing, though, that we've started doing, a couple of our board members have picked up on that because some of the data has changed from month to month. And one of the pieces that we've clarified with them is we're, we're constantly evolving it to, sh uh, to show the proper narrative. 
So this month we may be looking at trying to grow actual, ses uh, actual session counts. Well, next month we may be doing a massive push to grow our international users. So the piece that we're showing them is, okay, here's the initiative that we're working on, the KPI we're trying to match up, and this is the progress we've received. Again, it kind of goes back to that smoke and mirrors. You may have a month that's a little bit down on a piece. That's fine. It happens. You just have to have the ace in your pocket to be able to say, okay, we're down on users, but we're up on bounce rate. We're up on people spending more time on multiple pages per session. So the piece that the board want to see is they want to see growth. They want to see that you're doing something that's working in a positive nature. T and typically, they're never going to ask questions if you change that. And that's one of the best pieces about it. As long as they see growth and you can paint the narrative around it, that's all that they care about. I like that. That's a good tip. So we talked about this when I um, introduced you and then you corrected me on um, the 900% growth in the prospect funnel. I think everybody always wants to increase the prospect funnel. So talk to us about that process. Maybe walk us through um, your audience, your intent, and how that funnel really grew. The, the first step that we did was we received our goal. Well, we then broke that down into a daily goal. The piece that, uh, that a lot of people get stuck with is they may be given, a, just as a round figure, say somebody gives you, you need 10,000 leads for this program by the end of the year. That may be a very sizable goal. That may be very hard to digest. Well, if you break that down and figure it into days, that may equate into you need 100 leads a day. Well, now that becomes a much more attainable goal. Some days you may hit 120. Some days you may hit 60. But by looking at it from a daily goal over the course of the year, you can set the par and work to accomplish that on a smaller scale. And that saves you a little bit of sanity as well as helping you craft the, the strategy around it. Because then if you're looking at the fact of, okay, we need a thousand. Well, okay. If you produce 800 quality versus 1200 quantity leads, that's going to produce a lot larger conversion at the end of it when you've got higher quality to work with. Does that make sense? That absolutely makes sense, yes. And so one of the pieces that we did uh, when we started this process was we looked at our goal, we broke it down into those digestible chunks, and then we took it and segmented it out from there. We looked at, okay, we know our MBA track is going to be a hot commodity. We know our IT programs are going to be a hot commodity. So we focus a larger effort around the areas we know are going to convert higher and crafted individual strategies for each of the personas that work for those. So you break it into a digestible chunk and then you have to create the strategy around each one. Now around each chunk, you may have 20 strategies that you have to accomplish. You may have multiple campaign points. You may have multiple audiences, multiple channels that you're pushing stuff out. It's still a juggling act, but you're breaking it down to say, okay, we have five campaigns running. We produced 150 leads yesterday. Perfect. We're on pace. We're on par. And now we have a little bit of a cushion. So when you start setting that tone, don't get caught up by the numbers. Watch your rates. Watch how things are producing because you need to continually iterate. When we first started this, we were running our ads on a three-week cycle to test it, come up with a new ad and a new campaign messaging point to test it again. So it's constant A-B testing, making iterations based off of it. You may end up working a full circle coming back to the same piece you started with, but that's the whole process of optimizing the strategy. Does that make sense? That makes sense. There's just a whole lot there. So yeah. I'm just going to recap. So like the first one is breaking down your goal, then segmenting within the breakdown of those goals, and then crafting strategies for each of those segments. Yes. And I guess the fourth would probably be evolving or revising, you know, yep. when needed. Iterate, iterate, iterate. That's okay. the philosophy that we've taken. And that's where we, uh, we've had a couple powerhouse student workers over the summer that we told them, okay, we want 20 packages. Just give us creative around this message, this message, and this message. Well, then you have it, uh, you have it sitting and ready to go. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to be a student worker. It could be somebody on your design team. It could be anybody, or you could even outsource it. The piece that we found, and I wish I could move the camera around my office, you'd see that my walls are plastered with campaign pieces ready to go. The philosophy that I've adopted with that is I want to have it plug and play ready. That way, if we get a call from the president saying, okay, we want more students for our undergraduate nursing program. 
boom, I can pull it off the wall, craft a message with it, I already have the creative ready to go. And granted, that takes time to accomplish. But the biggest piece with it is you don't want to be in react uh, reactionary mode 24-7. You have to take the time to step back and craft a strategy around a long-term goal that's not just an immediate need. If, we, if only we all had time to be as proactive, to be able to have something plug and play ready, man, that would be ideal. But even yeah. if you have two or three, you're in pretty good shape. Yep, and that's like I said, we had a couple powerhouse student workers that I used and abused over the summer with just knocking out design work. And I know that, and they are awesome. I've already written several references and have one of them in a, in a full-time job now. The piece within that is just the fact that you have to take stock of what resources you have to then figure out what you need and craft the importance around it. Like I was saying, if you have one program that you know is a hot commodity for the funnel that you're trying to grow, focus your attentions there because you know it's gonna convert. And then slowly add in the other pieces to segment it and fill in the gaps. So how involved are you in, um, once you've generated the leads and you have the, the names, do you, you hand it off to your counselors, your admissions? Um, how involved are you guys in the strategies when it comes to actually like moving them through that funnel? I'd say about 50-50 right now. Wow, that's pretty one of the, Well, one of the reasons for that is because the way our system is structured, we handle all of the creative and all of the communication. So our admissions team, the way our, CR, the way our CRM is set up, they get the lead, they can actually contact the lead within two minutes of them submitting the form. The benefit of that is if you can get the response of, wow, that was fast, you're almost guaranteed to convert that student to coming and visiting or getting more information, even possibly an application. Now, granted, our admissions team is amazing and we have a large call center. We have a lot of recruiters that are working around the clock. That, again, is a piece that's not necessarily attainable by every institution right off the bat. The biggest piece with it is, again, when you're building your strategy, you want to look at more than just getting the form to convert. You want more than just the user to submit a form saying, I want information. You also want to think of touch point A, B, and C after. If, okay, they've said they want it, we're giving it to them, but now what is the secondary action we want? What can we start trying to convince them to do from there? That may be a virtual tour. That may be an on-campus visit. That may be, hey, sit down with us for 30 minutes so we can go over your career goals and give you an assessment as to what you still need to work on. There's a lot of steps that vary from school to school, and every school is stronger in other options. The piece with that, though, is you want multiple goals for that student, and you want to craft that ahead of time so that by the time that form is submitted, you're not trying to reach 10,000 students of leads without thinking through the secondary stage, okay, how can we convert that 10,000 into 600 new students? So at each stage of that funnel, you're setting a new goal based on the original goal. This just screams to me how important it is to have a site that is up to date, that is user friendly, that has that correct form on it, like you mentioned in that one example, um, and how how strong your relationships sort of need to be. We always talk about silos in higher ed, how strong yes. between admissions, communications, IT even, right? Yep. And one of the, uh, kind of on a step back from what you're looking at, well, there needs to be the inner working relationship between you and, the, and, and your other departments, you also have to take stock in your working relationship with your prospect. Is your website information centric? Are you telling the student something or are you asking them what they want? The piece with that is a lot of our students nowadays, if they can't get to the information with one finger, you'll never see that conversion. Mobile is more important than ever, and a piece beyond that is simplifying the interface of how they get to it. If you look at the new ORU website, the homepage has 10 buttons on it, and that's all. It's designed around, boom, you're here, what can we help you get to? It's not force-feeding information down their throat to try to convert them. It's helping them get where they want to go, and you build a lot more trust that way. You, uh, by helping them get to their final destination, they start to trust the way the site works and that it's not force-fed, but that you're helping in the organic nature of them searching for something. That is such a fascinating way to put it because you are building trust. Instead of them being confused by where to go or trying to figure it out on their own, they're really looking to that site as a guide um, yep. and being able to to... 
I don't know, almost predict the information that they're looking for probably carries a lot of weight. Yeah, and one of the pieces that we did, like I said, we spent a lot of time and energy on our website when we relaunched in May. Between May and August, we spent just shy of 200 man hours in classroom settings training our, our on-campus users and our recruiters on where content is located, how to make sure it's updated, how to, how to work within the website so that then when they're on the phone, they can tell a student, go here, click this, you'll see this, and they don't have to follow through it on their own with them, but it becomes user, uh, user-centric so that the user has a better experience. It's like, it's why Amazon works as well as it does. Yep, and that's actually an interesting point because if you look back through the history, Amazon has in there, has added new features to their website, but they have never once changed the design of their website. Oh, wow. They've never changed the interface of their website because the users were familiar with it, so they made improvements to the experience without changing the UI. If only we could all be Amazon, huh? Yeah, it would be nice. (laughs) Awesome. Well, I think that was all for the questions that I had. If any of the viewers out there have any questions, please use hashtag higher ed live. Is there any last um, thoughts you want to share with us, John, before we sign off? Uh, the biggest thing that if I can express this enough times, it's take, uh, take a couple minutes for yourself. When you get a goal like that, it's going to blindside you. You're going to feel overworked from day one. But if you can take the time, shut your office door, meet with your team, have an honest and open conversation about, okay, here's the goal. How can we achieve it and break it down into those individual segments? One, you'll be less stressed. And two, you'll have achievable goals for your team to feel like they're succeeding as well. That's a great tip. All right. Well, as always, thank you to our program sponsors, Chegg and M. Stoner. Thank you to our guest, John, who um, I'm going to embarrass him a little bit, is getting married in about a week and a half. So everybody send your congratulations to John at the end of this month. And um, tune in for the next episode of Ambitions Live um, next Monday. And on that note, also feel free, contact me at any time. My, you can find me on Twitter. My hashtag is in any of these pieces. Uh, give me a call, shoot me a message or something, and I'm, I would love to help you achieve this for yourself. Awesome. Thanks, everyone. See you guys.